Good morning, Hope Church. So good to be with you this Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but I watched that video. I just feel so much more peaceful already. Don't you? Come on, can we give it up for our creative team? They do such a, a great job putting together impactful videos like that. And uh, aren't you glad you live in Montana, <laughs> seeing the busyness of the city life and everything? Some of you are like, yeah, I moved here for that. But uh, here we are. Christmas is coming, and uh, I hope that you're ready. More importantly, I think that there is a preparation that we need to have, spiritually speaking, for the coming. Uh, many of you heard the term, and maybe you do Advent wreaths. We've done those with our kids and our family for years. And really, Advent means the arrival. It's the coming. And and I love doing that because it prepares our hearts spiritually for Jesus coming all over again. And each year, I believe, is a fresh opportunity for us to experience the arrival, Jesus coming, and what it, what it means to us and what it's meant to our world since his coming. And so we're, we're exploring that in this message series called The Weary World Rejoices. I think after several years of a global pandemic, uh, economic uncertainty, tension relationally with uh, uh, different uh, political parties and the tension, racial tension that is happening in our world and all the things that it, it weighs and it makes our souls weary. And for a lot of us, you come into the Christmas season, it's like, hey, this is a time of year where we're going to celebrate. It's going to be joyful. In fact, that's why one of the reasons we, we like to create and have some fun at church. And so I, I hope that you're okay with us wearing some ugly stuff. Hope you're okay with me reminding you, don't be a Grinch this Christmas season. And uh, that uh, really, Jesus came into a weary world. And he came in to return, the word rejoice actually means re-go back or return to joy. And for years, the, they call it the dark ages before Jesus was birthed. The, the, the prophets hadn't spoke, God hadn't spoken. Uh, people were wondering, where is God? He feels distant, he's not close, and he shows up as Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, he, he wants to restore joy, not only to them back then when he came, but he's continued to restore joy. And, and for us today, I believe the Christmas season, it could be a time of, of great joy and celebration. But I also think that it can be a time of, of grieving. It could be a time of grieving loss. I think the Christmas season, even uh, psychologists say that more suicides happen in the month of December than all the other months. And and I believe the reason for that, as I pondered it, it isn't that we have more problems, so to speak. I think it's that we feel our problems more. I think it's, you know, coming into the Christmas season, it's the end of the year, it's the 12th month, and thank you, John Lennon, you know, it's another year's over, what have you done? You kind of think about your life a little bit more. And in fact, you reflect, I believe, on your life a little bit more. And, and, you know, the Christmas season, getting together with family and, and extended family, sometimes it can exasperate feelings of relational tension and, and hurts and wounds of the past and broken relationships. And in the middle of all this, God is reminding us that it's time to rejoice. It's time to return to a place of joy. So my heart and prayer is that as we go through each week of this message series, that's exactly what would be happening in your own soul. Last week, if you were here, and if you weren't here, I, I encourage you, because each week kind of builds on the other, I talked to you about how uh, the world was tired of this thing called uh, judgmentalism and uh, following rules and law but not being in relationship with God. And then when Jesus came, he came full of grace. And to extend grace, which in return brought forgiveness. And today I want to take that to a, another level. And the next step is that when we receive the forgiveness of Christ, it frees us up to forgive and to be forgiven with each other. And so I don't know about you, but in my own life, you know, growing up in a, in a broken home, parents divorced at a very young age. And so I, I dealt with broken relationships from a very young age and how that affected me and how in return for a lot of us, the way that our relationship, even with our own parents, our own father, we can project those hurts and wounds onto Father God. And, and when Jesus came, he came in the middle of, of dark times, but he also came in the middle of relational tension and conflict. In fact, when he came, his own people 
were under Roman rule and authority. They, they weren't free people. They were slaves, if you will, to Rome. They had to pay taxes. And, and some of their own people, uh, they considered traitors for going over and helping the Romans by collecting their taxes and different things. And then there were other groups of, of their people who they considered half-breeds, the Samaritans. And, and there was uh, these, like I mentioned last week, the religious people who followed the, the rules and the law religiously and did all the right things and said all the right things and, and looked the right way. And, and there was this religious veneer that had got on them that they, they had this false sense of identity, even, even saying that, you know, we're sons of Abraham. And so therefore, you know, we're accepted by God. And then the other people they looked down on, that there was this like this religious caste system, if you will, where everybody else was kind of shunned and, and they were unclean people. And so Jesus shows up in the middle of this relational tension where there was fighting and wars and, and, and even their own people wanted to th overthrow the Roman government and there's other people that didn't. And there's all this tension that Jesus shows up in the middle. And we're gonna look at and start out the message today reading probably the most famous passage about the birth of Jesus in Luke chapter two. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn there with me, Luke chapter two. Um, before I, I get going a little bit too much this morning, I just wanna uh, take a moment to welcome our church in Eureka. Would you do me a favor? Put your hands together for your brothers and sisters in Hope Eureka. We love you guys. So grateful for you, praying for you. God, I know has something powerful for you today. Also, I want to just take a moment to welcome all of you who are joining us online. We love that technology affords for you to be with us today. Even as I was praying uh, for this service, I really felt like there was going to be some people joining us online that this message was really tailor-made to you, that God was going to speak to you. So my hope and prayer is that he does that. But let's read together out of Luke chapter 2 read to you out of the NIV. It goes like this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Thank you, Charlie Brown. Let's just bring back images of when you're a kid listening to Charlie give his monologue. But could you picture, I want you to just picture the scene because just like uh, Evan was encouraging us this morning at the end of worship, I think we could go the, through the motions of Christmas. We could come, we could sing the songs, we could do the deal, we could give the presents. We could go through the season and we could miss the wonder and the awe of this person called Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. This, this is the moment in history, and the Bible says that this is the appointed time for God to come. In other words, this isn't by happenstance that Jesus is being born. This is exactly the time in history that God had appointed for Jesus to be born. And this is the moment. And an angel shows up and the glory around them. And you imagine these, these shepherds, a lot like us, you know, just their daily routine, if you will, of taking care of the shepherds out in the field one night, going through that routine. And all of a sudden they're, they're surrounded by this immense light coming at them. And this isn't close encounters of another kind, right? This is an alien invasion. This is God invading earth. And an angel coming in the glory of the Lord to announce his arrival and his coming. And said, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid, because they were terrified. I mean, who wouldn't be? And he said, don't be afraid. And here it is. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. Not just a little joy, not just happiness that the world would try to get us to believe is what we need to kind of you know, experience the things that we want to experience in this life so that we can have happiness, so we can have a quote-unquote good Christmas. He says, I bring you good news. How many of you could use some good news this morning? Well, here it is. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for some people, for the people that follow God, all of, do all the right way. No, for all people. He says, today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the anointed one. He is the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Now, can you just imagine when I think about the arrival of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I don't, I don't first of all, think of him coming as a baby. 
a vulnerable little child. No, I think about him coming in a palace, right? And you think the host of angels could have cleared out the palace and said, hey, make room for the king of kings. He's gonna come and he's gonna sit on his throne. I've often wondered why did he have to come as a fragile baby? Couldn't he just come as a full man, you know, grown man, strong, powerful? He come down and just pronounce everyone forgiven who believes in him and ascend back into heaven at the, and be seated at the right hand of God and call it good. But I love the fact that he came vulnerable as a baby, that he actually experienced everything that we go through as human beings from birth to death. And then he came fragile with a fragile soul and fragile body, but he was fully God and yet fully human. The Bible says he experienced everything that we went through. And I love that he, he didn't want to miss one part of it. He said, I want to have the full experience from baby to, from birth to death. And he says, this will be a sign you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly, now it's not just one angel. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, and here it is, verse 14. One of the most famous sayings about Christmas, you read it on Christmas cards. I think I gave a few of them this year already with this verse on it. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those in whom his favor rests. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those whom God's favor rests. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this historical account of the coming of your son, Jesus. God, I pray that we wouldn't just go through the motions of the Christmas season. We wouldn't get caught up in all the, the worldly things that, that we do to celebrate the arrival of Jesus. But I pray that just like John the Baptist would preach, that we would prepare the way for the Lord to be birthed afresh and anew in our hearts, in our souls, in our spirits. God, I pray that as we encounter the freshness of your coming once again, that it would lead us more and more into the joy of the Lord and that we would be strengthened, that weariness would break off of us. For many of us that came in this morning or maybe watching online that are just tired, worn out, burdened, overwhelmed. God, I pray that today that we would take on your yoke. It's light and it's easy. Would you set us free from that weariness and return us to the place of joy in Jesus name? Amen, 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 amen. The title of my message to you this morning is called True Peace. True Peace. Now, Jesus comes into and is birthed into this world. And, and we read that scripture, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth and goodwill to man. And, and, and rightly so, we can believe that Jesus came to peace. In fact, we sang about the names of, of God this morning. And one of the names attributed uh, that Isaiah would prophesy over the coming Messiah, Jesus, Prince of Peace, <laughs> right? He's not, he's not, he didn't come to just give peace. He is the Prince of Peace. In other words, uh, there, there's a King of Peace that is God the Father in heaven. And he sent his one, one and only Son as an ambassador of peace to bring peace to the world, right? And he did that through the life that he lived, the sinless life that he lived, and, and most importantly, uh, which we will celebrate in the Easter season, his sacrificing his life on the cross his death on the cross and his burial and his resurrection into new life, which now he can offer us forgiveness of sins. And last week as we took communion together, we were reminded of the grace. In John chapter one, we read about how Jesus came that before he came as a baby, he existed before the world was even created. That, that actually everything that was created was created through him and in him and for him, and that he came full of grace, but also full of this thing called truth. 
And so we often think about Jesus, you know, our peace, our Prince of Peace, as our Savior. He's going to come and he's going to bring me peace. But it's interesting, when you study the life of Jesus, uh, although he was bringing some peace to people through his uh, miracles that he did, through his, his teachings of truth that he brought to them, that he also came with a sword cutting down the religious veneer that was put over people to try to give them this semblance of what I would call false peace. That this, this idea of false peace was prevalent when Jesus arrived and it actually weighed on people. Now think about um, the old covenant and how they would atone for sin. In other words, how they would find themselves or how they would get back to right standing or be in right relationship with God. The way that, that, that it was set up through the Old Testament in which Jesus came, John would proclaim that, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They would actually take a, a unblemished, uh, perfect lamb or calf or whatever animal. There were several different animals that they would use for sacrifices, but they would take a unblemished, unspotted, perfect lamb and they would slaughter it on the altar. And, and they would use the, the blood as a representation of making atonement for their sin. And atonement simply means covering. It would cover their sins so that God would not see or recognize their sin anymore and they could find themselves justified or in right standing, righteous before God and be restored into relationship with him. But if we're gonna be honest with each other, a lot of us, just like in, in their day, even though they, they would make these sacrifices and atonement for their sin, many of them, head knowledge wise, would know that I'm supposed to be forgiven by God. And yet somehow inside, I'm carrying around this weight, I'm walking around and in my soul, I feel this disconnection between me and God. That even though my sins are paid for, that I actually don't experience his presence. I'm not walking closely in relationship with him. I'm actually stuck in religion. And that was the case for many people when Jesus showed up. And Jesus came not only to live a spotless, blameless, sin-free life and then go to the cross and pay the penalty for our sin, but he also came to break the power of sin off of our lives so that the, the, the power of sin would have no more reign and rule over us, that the weight of what we've carried around for years. And, and now this is where I want to get to this morning because I truly believe that for many of us, we know we've been forgiven. We know that God has forgiven people that have hurt us and we've, we've hurt God, so to speak, in relationship with him by in our own pride and in, in trying to do our life in our own way apart from living according to God's word and his commands in our life that we've said, God, we've got this. And just like Adam and Eve, uh, we, we, we fall into sin and then we go into hiding from God because of our guilt and shame. And many of us walk around with this disconnection and yet we're celebrating Emmanuel, God with us, that his presence drew near. And that Jesus came not only to, to bring God to us physically, but he came to set us free from the power of sin and the power and the weight of unforgiveness and how it can separate us relationally. And so as he restored that, and last week as we took communion, and we, I reminded you that, that through the grace of God and what Jesus did, there is nothing between you and God anymore. It opened up the, the, the door, if you will, for us to step into a relationship, a living, life-giving, every day that I have access to his presence and I can live with God. And yet for many of us, we, we come to church, we go to Bible studies, we raise our hands, we sing the songs, we know the right things to say, but we're, we're not in communion with God daily. There's things between us and him that we haven't reconciled and also, there's things between us and our brothers and sisters. There's things between our husband, our wives, our sons, our daughters, our, our parents, our fathers, our mothers, our grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, leaders, you name it. And Jesus, when he died, think about this. 
He died to restore us into right relationship vertically between us and God, to forgive us and to restore our relationship and to reconcile us back to God and restore us into right, right relationship as sons and daughters. Bring us into the family of God. That's the beauty of the church. However, the principle of the cross, and even as Jesus would get chastised by the Pharisees and, and hey, what's the greatest commandment? And he would remind them the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul. And they got that one. Yeah, yeah, you know, we, we know that. We, that's how we live our lives. We do that. He says, but let me remind you, the second one is equally as important. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, this is the principle of the cross. You cannot just have forgiveness and be in right relationship with me without forgiving each other for your offenses, for the hurts, the pains, and the wounds that you've caused each other or that you've caused. That forgiveness and restoration in right relationship with, with me means that now you are free to forgive other people of the hurt and the pain and the wounds that they've caused you and to be free of the wounds and the pain and the hurts that you've caused other people. It's the principle of the cross. That I have this vertical restoration and forgiveness that leads me to this horizontal forgiveness and restoration of relationship. But for many of us, just like the religious people of the day that Jesus would confront we could fall into this trap of living not with true peace that Jesus came to give us, but we could live in this trap of living under a false peace. That is that everything's fine, I'm good, you're good. We could come to church and say hi to one another. And, and how are you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing good, man. How are you doing, sister? Oh, we're, do, we're doing good. Everything's fine. Everything's lovely. It's Christmas. We're, we're supposed to be happy people. Come on, we're in church, right? And, uh, and yet inside we could be holding in unforgiveness, bitterness. Anger. We could be upset because somebody's hurt us or offended us. And, and, and yet... I think in church circles, this is the worst because we're supposed to be peacemakers, right? And, and we don't even really understand what that word means. And I hope to help bring some understanding to that word. But we can create this false sense of peace. Like we're okay. We're okay between God and we're okay with other people. So I want to give you a little bit of a, a working definition. Last week, I talked to you about breaking off this thing called legalism that can weigh on us. Today, I, wanna, I want us to break off this thing called false peace that can weigh on us, that, that there's this appearance, temporary, worldly peace that we can have, but it's not the true peace that Jesus came to give us. So what is this false peace? False peace, this is kind of a definition I threw together, is a worldly, temporary, false feeling of relief or escape rather than true peace. And even the religious leaders of the day, um, they, they, they lived under this religious guise, this religious veneer. And, and the prophets of long ago, even in Jeremiah's time, who, who would prophesy about the coming of Jesus, he would talk about the, the religious leaders and the prophets not really addressing the real issues between God and people and, and between people and each other. And just kind of like, you know, we're, we're okay, I'm okay, you're okay. And this is what he would say in Jeremiah 6, 14. He says, they dress, listen to this, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. And so Jeremiah, through the prophet, God was speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, and, he's, and God was grieved because he wanted to restore his relationship with his people. And he was tired of seeing the conflict between brother and, and, and brother, sister and sister, brother and father, and, and their kids. And, and so Jesus shows up and we think, oh, here comes nice Jesus, you know, little baby Jesus, he's birthed and, and he's gonna be really nice and he's gonna be the Prince of Peace and restore just, you know, everything wonderful. And, and we think of Jesus, you know, that way. And, and yet Jesus shows up and he, he doesn't allow that veneer of religiosity to cover the lack of real peace. He comes in and he speaks directly into it when he starts preaching. 
He comes to the religious leaders and he comes, you brood of vipers. Like, who told you of the coming wrath? You know, this peaceful Jesus. And, uh, and, and he was constantly getting in their face. He, he would go to the, the temple one day and he would see that they were, they were changing money and they, they, they took God's house and started making it into a den of thieves and were, you know, having sacrifices so people didn't actually have to get their own animal. I'll just show up, you know, at Walmart and I'll buy my own sacrifice. And, and they would charge them five times as much, you know, profiting off the fact that they knew people are busy and they're going to show up and want to sacrifice something. So let's sell it. And Jesus shows up and he throws over, you know, the money to him. Can you imagine the disciples like, whoa, like Jesus settle down. Like, who is this guy? Like, Calm down, man. You know, it's going to be all right. And, but he was, he was, disrupting their false peace. And so we have to understand something, that the kingdom of God cannot come in lies. It has to come in, in, in truth. That Jesus, even though he was full of grace, that he did not compromise the truth. And he wasn't willing to allow his people to operate relationally under this guise of false peace. I'm okay, you're okay, we're, we're okay with each other. No, he, he came and he confronted the religious people and even us who, who would have something against his brother. Even Jesus, relationally, at one time, his parents, his mother and his brothers would come. He's teaching and they kind of, there's a knock on the door and say, hey, te teacher, uh, your mom and your brothers, and, and says, they're outside waiting for you. And, and they want to they wanna bring you home. And, and we know from scripture that even his own family thought he was nuts. I thought he's out of his mind. Like, you're just a carpenter. You're the brother. We used to play games together. Now you're just a Messiah? Like, come on, bro. Let's go home. You lost it. Okay? And, and his, even, even his mother didn't believe in him. But, but Simeon, the prophet, when they would bring baby Jesus into the temple, and the prophet Simeon, who'd been waiting his whole life to see the Messiah, would, would prophesy wonderful things over the baby Jesus. And you know, when you're getting a prophecy, if you ever experienced that, it's like, oh yes, give me the good word. Yeah, I love that. Oh, this is amazing. I'm crying. You could picture Mary and Joseph just being so stirred by the beautiful words Simeon was saying. And then he ends with this. He says, Mary, even your own soul is going to be pierced through with a sword. Wait, wait. <laughs> come on. Where's the nice, peaceful, nice prof prophetic word for me that I can feel good about? But it, it was actually the truth of God to prophesy to her that this is going to challenge you. Like you're going to get confronted with some false things that maybe you're believing. And so we see this dichotomy between Jesus who, who came to be the Prince of Peace and to bring peace on earth through what he would do. But then we see this in Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 what Jesus would exclaim about himself and his coming. And he said this. He said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Whoa, well, wait a minute, stop the press. Is that right? Is it, which translation is that? Uh, and, and this is what Jesus would say about it. So is he, is he Jesus that brings us peace or is he Jesus that brings a sword? Which one is he? Yes. <laughs> He's both. And this is oftentimes, you know, we, we see these things, like, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. No. The reality is that he could be both things at once. Actually, it's, it's not a contradiction of who he was and what he came to do. Because by confronting them with a sword, in other words, bringing war to them, he wasn't allowing them to live and stay in a place of false peace. He was, he was trying to help them see the, the lies they were living under in the guise of, of pretense that, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at peace, but the reality that, no, you're not. And I'm not willing because I love you and care about you enough to bring you the truth and disrupt your false peace. So he would go on to say, you know, for I have come to turn man against his father, father, um, uh, his daughter against his mother-in-law, and mother-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies will become out of his own household. And he was really speaking about that when people would receive Jesus and begin to follow him as Messiah, that it's going to cause problems. Like, this is going to mess you up. And it's not going to be a peaceful thing because your family's going to think you're crazy. It kind of reminds me of when... Uh, 
I told my, uh, my wife and I told our family we were moving to Montana because God told us to. And, you know, they thought we were absolutely, we lost it. I just graduated college, top of my class, come laude, uh, getting accepted to these graduate schools, and that was my plan. I was going to go on to get my, you know, hopefully PhD someday, and, you know, I, all that. And God shows up in the middle of it and disrupts that plan and says, yeah, I want you to go to Montana and, and help the uh, friends of ours, pastor and his wife, start this little country church. I'm like, gee, this is, this is one I had in mind quite, you know? And our family thought we were absolutely nuts. And, and yeah, they're, you know, okay, okay. But behind the scenes, they're talking, you know, they would keep the peace. And this is what a lot of us do, right? We, we, instead of doing what Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And he said that because anytime that you, you make peace, you're actually acting like your father. You're acting like God because God is all about peace. But, but this disruption and the difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. And depending on your family of origin, a lot of us, we grew up in families and it's like, and, and I think around the Christmas holidays, this is exasperated because we get together with family we haven't seen. And, and sometimes there's, you know, relational tension and your mother accused my mother about buying cheap hot dogs and your mother accused my mother about waxing her upper lip. And thank you, Christmas holiday. <laughs> And before you know it, like, you know, the dinner table, it's awkward and there's tension, but you just kind of endure, you know, the Christmas holiday because it's like, that's what you do. You want to keep the peace. I remember years ago, like my wife is, uh, God bless you, you had to walk in at this moment, right? Um, I, my wife, she's a Christmas nut. See, how many Christmas nuts out there? Like you, you go all out for Christmas and then and I love my wife. She loves Christmas. And if you come to our house, it, it looks like walking into winter wonderland. Like, I mean, there's lights everywhere. I mean, like I got to take a second mortgage for my light bill, but it's okay. You know, um, lights are everywhere. It looks beautiful. And she's very particular, you know, that we hold to Christmas traditions, right? And all of us have them, different things and things that we just, you know, they have to be a certain way. And one of the things for years, it was like, we have to have a real tree. You know, we're real tree people. Like, no, we don't buy those fake trees. Now, that's not a Christmas tree, especially in Montana. I think it's even more like we're in Montana, right? We got to get us a, we got to do the, you know, the, the family thing and, and go out to the woods and find the, you know, the glory around the right tree. And, and so this is what we did for years as a family. It was like a big deal. You know, this is, this is like, this is a big deal. We're going to get the family Christmas tree. And so there used to be this Christmas tree farm, actually, that was not too far from the church, like around the corner. In fact, that was our tradition. We'd go to church, you know, to service like this. And, um, and then we would go do the family, you know, Christmas tree thing. And, and so we show up and, and uh, you know, we got kids in tow. We got five kids and they're all little at that point. And there's like maybe a, I don't know, not quite a foot of snow in the ground. And there's all these trees, you know, at this Christmas tree farm. And I'm like, all right, babe, let's, let's go. And, you know, I, I walk in and, and two minutes in, I'm like, you know, this looks like a good one. Like, doesn't that, isn't that nice? Like, let's get, this, let's get this, baby, let's go. And she's like, no, it's, you know, it's not quite right. There's a little limb here. It's just, it's at, you know, there's a spot here. It's not really full. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So let's walk around a little bit more. And before you know it, an hour goes by. And we don't have a Christmas tree picked out. And I'm trying to be the loving, kind, patient husband, you know. And, 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 and this is supposed to be a fun family thing. And I'm trying to keep the peace, right? And, and so finally, I'm like, babe, can we just pick a Christmas tree for crying out loud, right? It's been an hour. And she's like, well, you know, I kind of had one picked out, but I was afraid to tell you. I'm like, just tell me. Like, let's do this. And so finally, she takes me over. Like, it, 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 she takes me over to, no joke, the biggest Christmas tree on the whole Christmas tree farm. And I've got this, you know, little saw, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to just, you know, a couple of strokes, psh, baby's going to be down, we're going to be good. And I get down, so I'm like, all right, kids, come on over, dad's going to chop down the Christmas tree, you know. And so I get my saw out, and, and, and I am not a lumberjack, I'm a city guy, so here I am, I got this dull saw, and I get down in the snow, in my knee, and I start sawing, right. And I'm sawing for five minutes, and I made this much of a dent in a tree trunk this big. Like, this isn't just like a little tree. This trunk is like, this is a real tree. And I'm sawing, I'm sweating, and I'm just, every stroke, I'm getting more annoyed. 
And so I'm like, I get up, I'm ripping off my layers, my, you know, down coat is coming off. Uh, my wife's like, the kids are backing up. And you know, she's like, come on, kids, time to put on your earmuffs because I'm cussing I, under my breath. I'm grumbling and, you know, I'm trying to hold it together here. But I'm losing my Christianity and I'm losing my mind. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I'm sawing, sawing, sawing. You want help? No, I got this. It's fun. We're having a good time, you know. And uh, so we get, the, we get the tree down, and then we got to drag it to the car and try to get it on the car. And it's hanging off. I can barely see out the windshield, you know. And I'm wondering, we're like, we're like this aren't like twine. We're like ropes. We're like, this is, this is nautical ropes holding this baby down. And we make it home and everything. And, you know, I'm just, I'm like, thank God we finally get home. And then we try to get it in the doorway. And guess what? It doesn't fit through the door. So I got to take the door off the hinges. And we start to get, I'm like, come on, kids, all five. And we're like, push, come on, push. We're going to get it through the door. We got to do it. Almost there. You know, we finally smush the thing. And, and on the sides of the door, it's, it's, it's a mess. Sap everywhere. You know, the stuff's falling everywhere. But finally we get in the house and everything. And I am so mad by now. Like, I don't even want to put anything on. I'm like, you, you guys do this. Dad, out. I'm going to watch some football or something. And, and you know how it is. It's like, I've sat with married couples in my office. And they're talking, like, seriously, they're talking about, you know, divorce. And and they're like, I don't know how we got here because, you know, just, just like that scenario, I think, you know, we're mad at each other. She's frustrated with me for getting frustrated. We're mad at each other, but, you know, we do the, the peacekeeping thing, you know, which is like, you know, we, we just move on. We don't really address the issue. We just kiss and make up and we kind of go on, you know, with life and, and we're too busy. We never really talk about what happened. We never really address the real problem and confront the lies that we're, we're believing maybe about each other or about how we handle conflict in our relationship. We just kind of move on. And yet the reality is, is most of us, we do that. We get hurt by somebody. Somebody hurts us. They wounds us. They, they say something to us that cuts us like a knife. And, and we walk around with these wounds. And if we don't address them, we, we just try to, hey, let's just keep the peace. Meanwhile, it's like this cancer that builds up in us. And over time, the, the bitterness and the anger that can build up because we've got this cancer inside of us. How many of you remember years ago, the, the video game Angry Birds? <laughs> remember when they, Angry Birds was really popular? That was a really fun game. And I remember playing that game, you know, and the whole, and it just blew up. They made, you know, like stuffed animals with the Angry Birds. And it was a big thing for a lot of years. But I remember I thought this is a really funny and interesting and weird game all in one in that, uh, you know, you have these birds and they're angry. <laughs> and, and they're angry because these pigs stole their eggs. And so now what the angry birds do to get revenge and get back at the pigs is they launch themselves, you know, onto the pigs and try to crush them and destroy them. But in the process, they're only destroying and killing themselves. And I think this is what happens with a lot of us is we've been hurt by people, people that we love, people that we're close to. We've been hurt in the church. And we carry these wounds and these hurts and these offenses with us. And it becomes like a cancer. And, and we don't even realize it, but we start to become short with people. Um, we, we, we border up our hearts for protection, and we only let people so far in, and that's it. And we even think that just being mad at them and not forgiving them is somehow going to get re exact revenge, like, because we're withholding our forgiveness, and we're, we're mad about it, and it's been years, but it, it's become like a cancer. And, and Jesus says, I, don't, I haven't come to just bring peace. I've come to bring a sword, and I was thinking about that. You know, the Bible talks about God being like the great physician, the one who brings healing to us. And I thought about a sword being like the scalpel. When, when you have a tumor or if you have a cancer and you go in for surgery, it's, it's, it's tension, it's conflict, it's painful to have the surgery done. But I know a lot of people, because they know, they know something's wrong in their body, but they're actually afraid to go to the doctor because they're afraid to confront what's wrong. And because of it, they allow the cancer to, to dwell in their body and slowly eat away, and it's killing them, little by little. 
And Jesus shows up and he says, no, I've come to heal you of your wounds, but I'm not gonna be like the religious leaders who just put a Band-Aid on your hurt and on your offense and tell you and blow on it and kiss it and say, it's gonna be okay. No, I'm gonna be like the great physician. I'm gonna put you on the, on the table and I'm, we're gonna do heart surgery. And I'm gonna go in with a, with a sword. In fact, the word sword is, is more in the original language. It's more like a, a, a knife. And he's gonna go in with a scalpel and he's going to take the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the anger and I'm gonna take it out of you so that you can be healed and you can be set free from it. And that you can not only be healed and set free, but you can be reconciled. Now, reconcile simply means that I'm, I, am, I am taking something that was done. Think about when Jesus says, I, not only did God forgive us, but he says, I have cast your sin as far as from the east as from the west. I, I have no record of your sin anymore. Like I've reconciled your doing good and, I, and guess what? That reconciliation says that you are completely righteous before God because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because you've been rightly reconciled with God, I don't want it to stop there. I don't want the healing to stop there because you can have vertical healing and reconciliation with God, forgiveness, but we can't just because we're Christians walk around under this guise of false peace, like I'm okay, we're okay, and, and yet I've got, this, I've got this hurt, I've got this wound inside of me that I'm just brushing under the rug and I brushed it on the rug for years, pretending like it's okay, I've minimized it, I've avoided it. You know, we do the brush under the rug. I always like to say it like this. You can only brush things under the rug for so long before you start to trip over the pile. And I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me this message, put this message on my heart to bring to you today because I believe that there's some of us that the thing that is weighing on your heart is the fact that you've carried these wounds and offenses for so long that you've just told yourself, it's okay. I'm okay. I'm good. But the reality is, is it's been like a weight on your soul that is year after year wearing you down little by little and it is killing like a cancer your spiritual life and robbing you of the joy that Jesus came to restore you to. So my prayer is that today we would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, choose out of our own self-will to forgive and not just forgive, but choose also to forget. Do you know in the love chapter it says that we keep no account of wrongs. It's not enough just to choose to forgive somebody. But if we keep bringing back up, if we keep allowing it to replay in our mind, and, and trust me, it will. And, and listen to me, this morning, I'm not, I'm not up here as a pastor, preacher, just giving you a, a message about this. I've lived this. I've had to do this in my own life. I have to continually do it in my own life. It's amazing to me that, that in the church, we experience the most pain that we, we can wound each other the most in the church. And, you know, I grew up in a broken home, divorced family at an early age, and had to deal with that, that hurt, that wound from that broken relationship. And then, you know, becoming a Christian, you think, oh, this is going to be wonderful. And I come to church as a pastor, and I've had friends turn their back on me, leave me. I've had, you know, people, even in this last couple of years, just the pain of all that has just has been tremendous and I've had to work I've, I've had to reconcile that in my own heart but we don't want to be peace just a peacemaker we want to be peace keep we don't want to be a peacekeeper in other words we want to be a peacemaker peacekeeper is a tendency to avoid and to appease for the sake of keeping peace so this whole message the big idea is this Jesus came to disrupt the false peace and restore us to true peace which leads to great joy and just like last week, I want us to, um, as we kind of come to a close, I want us to look at a clip from The Chosen. And in this clip, it's the, the story of Jesus actually creating a divine appointment to disrupt this woman's daily routine so that he can bring healing and forgiveness to her heart and restore her, not only in right relationship to God, 
but right relationship with others in her life. Watch this. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, would you ask her to drink for me a Samaritan? And a woman? I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the cool of the morning? Yeah. Uh, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come with you. In the heat, so you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to throw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank Him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. It won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. believe what I'm telling you. Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am He. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. 
Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him. Because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. And you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise. I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait! <laughs> your water! You forgot your um. The your man who told me everything I ever did! <laughs> Come on, I love that. And all this is from God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I love that in that moment, he reminds, Jesus reminds the woman, by the way, men, especially Sumerian women, Jesus was not supposed to, according to the law, even be there talking to this woman. But he comes and he says, I've come here just for you. Like I, I'm here in the middle of the day just to have this encounter with you and just to disrupt your false peace. And I love, you know, he had to bring up her past to bring healing to it, to set her free so that she wouldn't be bound by it any longer. And I honestly believe that, that some of you are here this morning and God brought you here. And Jesus had marked this day on the calendar and said, this is the day that I'm gonna confront your false peace. And I'm gonna bring healing to you. And I'm gonna allow you, I'm gonna give you the, the grace even to be able to forgive those who hurt you. And to reconcile it, to forget about it, to choose. Forgiveness isn't something that we feel Forgiveness is a choice, and it, by the way, it's a command from God that we forgive because we've been first forgiven. And I think oftentimes we forget the great debt that we owe God that He forgave us of. And who are we to withhold that forgiveness? But as we close, I just wanna pray for some of us. Because I believe that, that we've been weighed down with unforgiveness and there's been a lack of peace that is wearing us out. So I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. I just wanna invite the Holy Spirit to just come now in this moment as we close. I wanna ask you, there's two groups of people that I wanna close by praying for. One of you is maybe you're here today and you have You've never come into right relationship with God. Like you've never felt Emmanuel, God with you. 
There's just been this big chasm between you and God and you've felt like he's mad at you, that he doesn't approve of you. And yet he's coming here to call you his son or daughter, to welcome you home into his presence. So if that's you and you'd like to receive Jesus, today can be your day. This could be your moment. Maybe you're online and you could just put it in the comment that I, I want to receive Jesus. We'll have a pastor reach out to you. But if that's you, I want you to just pray this prayer. God, I'm tired of living life on my own. I want to be restored in right relationship to you. I repent from my way of living and surrender to your will. Would you forgive me, wash me clean, and restore me into right relationship with you? Amen. And you can say that prayer, and God will come into your life and make all things new. For the rest of us, how many of you would say, I've got a hurt, I've got a wound, I've got an offense that has kind of kept me from experiencing the joy. It's been weighing on me. Just slip up your hand. I just want to pray for you. First service, it was like 75% of the people. It's what I would expect. I want to pray right now for you. I want you to stand to your feet. And if you raise your hand, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I want you to raise your other hand to heaven. Come on, just stand to your feet right now. We're going to close in a moment by worshiping God. But Jesus even said, don't come to the altar and bring your gift. In other words, don't worship me until you've made it right with your brother or sister first. Before we even end our service, worshiping God, I believe some of us need to do business. We need to do heaven's business. So I want you to just think of that person or that offense. And right now, I want you to, under your breath, or maybe it's during our worship time, just say, God, I choose to forgive, and you fill in the blank. I no longer hold anything against them. I release them into your hands in Jesus' name. And the peace of God, I believe, will come upon you, and you will be free from that way. So Holy Spirit, right now, I pray that you would come. Touch the hearts of your people this morning. I break off every spirit of offense that would try to keep them locked in the prison of offense. That you would release them from the trap of offense this morning. And I pray that you would restore the joy to them that you came to give in Jesus' mighty name.